Happy Heresies, my beloved Truth Seekers. That voice you just heard is your voice. It is the collective voice of the cosmic ego when it's not thrashing in stormy fury and demanding the psychic blood sacrifice of your loved ones. It is the fear, the anxiety, and the nausea that we constantly feel as we walk the labyrinths of this world, turning our head at each corner wondering when the minotaur of our darkest secrets will finally catch up to us. We run, we hide, we make excuses. We rob Paul to pay Peter instead of the other way around. We lie to ourselves, saying everything is alright, and then run even faster. We run in place, frozen by our unending ghostly guilt. We compare ourselves to others who are really in the same anguish. The Minotaur gets closer. The sunset comes in like a tidal wave. We pretend we're not going to die. We keep running through the labyrinth. There must be some kind of way out of here. But if we only knew that what is chasing us is our own selves, fragmented a long time ago by the indoctrination of society and the rape of the Archons, that we are only as sick as our secrets, and those secrets are the doorway to escaping the labyrinth. If we would embrace the darkness around and inside of us, take our hands off the walls of comparison, and just simply stop, just stop, enough moving into the future and paying homage to the past. Enough. Just stop. Stop for a second. What if this is as good as it gets? And as our fragmented, mutilated self gores us with its tender horns, light suddenly exploding from the darkness that knows it not, then we might look down and see a golden cord that was there the entire time. And if we follow it slowly, understanding that we ourselves left it there before being trapped in the flesh, we'll get to the end of the labyrinth of the Demiurge. And we'll see a shining silhouette clothed in the stars and sun, a lady with arms open, eyes the color of the alchemist's gold, ocean lips smiling with motherly hope. Mother is the name for God on the lips and hearts of all children. Or perhaps you'll witness a naked maiden with her skin engraved in shining Greek letters like the Gnostic magician Marcus did when he terrorized Irenaeus in France around the second century. Marcus called her Charis or Grace in Greek. She has also been known as the Shekinah of Yahweh, Akamoth, Chakma, Barbalo, the Holy Spirit and several other names. But we also know her as Sophia. You no trouble. Me, fifth element, supreme being, me, protect you, hmm? sleep. And Sophia, the fallen wisdom of the solar gods that have given us painful spiritual sentence for 2,000 years, has also spread herself in many avatars in a rescue operation of mankind, when she and all of us can enter the bridal chamber and be reunited with the divine reason and become fulfilled, enlightened, and complete. Just like we once were once upon an infinity. You ask me if I have a god complex? Let me tell you something, I am God. Like the Gospel of Philip says, The Lord said, Blessed he who is before he came into being, for he who is, has been and shall be. Yes, Sophia has emanated herself into Eve, Zoe, Norea, Hypatia, Helen of Tyana, and other feminine principles. Another of the resurrected Aeonic standards of Sophia is of course Mary Magdalene. She's made a comeback with a vengeance in the last few decades, although she has always mesmerized the artists and yearners of history. There's just something about Mary. And this is our topic today on this approximately September 1st, 2007 on Coffee, Cigarettes and Noses. You're all going to die down here. To better understand Mary of Magdala, our astral guest today is Jane Schauberg, author of Mary Magdalene Understood and The Resurrection of Mary Magdalene, as well as Professor of Religious Studies and Women's Studies at the University of Detroit Mercy. Her books are both scholarly and passionate when it comes to the woman with the alabaster jar, 
Jane goes further than the canonicals or the apocryphal gospels, delving into the legends, expressions of artists, and words of the church fathers. And it's a good thing that Jane does that, because as much interest as there has been on Mary M., there has almost been as many misconceptions on her. You got the wrong guy, I'm the dude, man. These days, with all the Da Vinci rage, she seems to have become just a place where Jesus places holy sperm in order to give him all these wonderful hairs that by now would be in the millions. Hey, you might be a descendant of Jesus, which means time to ask the Romans and Israel for reparations. Huh, <laughs> what a bunch of donkey baloney. And that is just one misconception that Jane will tackle in our interview. Like Kai Longfellow mentioned in the past show, it works out perfectly that Pope Gregory anointed her as a whore in 591. After all, during that time, Sophia was being cast to the side like a whore on dollar night after the end of the shift. Jehovah had come unleashed upon earth without mercy now that he'd lost his divine consort. And thus Mary Magdalene and Sophia stood outside the portal of mankind's soul for so many centuries. You were raped? Oh, at first, yes. And then, just so recently, after the sands of Egypt began to puke out the secrets of the crimes of orthodoxy and release gnosis in a spiritual virus form, Mary Magdalene and thus Sophia were elevated to their rightful positions. Or I should say they are being elevated slowly. Looking at the incoming clash of the Abrahamic faiths, it seems she or they couldn't have come at a better moment. And once they are high enough, Mary will stand with the Christ as Sophia stands with the Cosmic Christ. And like I said before, divine wisdom and divine reason will be equal and wedded, healing us and perhaps even the predatory universe. And what if you could go back in time and take all those hours of pain and darkness and replace them something better. We shouldn't just hope, we should aid them for it is in our best interest, lest we fall back into the labyrinth and pull Cadiz, Sophia, back down with us. And you won't be surprised that the way to do it is through Gnosis, the divine knowledge of the self. We are all gods in the becoming, but Sophia and the Christ are higher than gods. They are aeons. So light up some tobacco substance, light up your bowl, incense, or your husband's bed. Grab yourself some fuel for your cup or your favorite herbal tea, and enter the virtual Alexandria, where we come together with Sophia to uncover the ultimate rescue operation that was already prepared as soon as the Divine had had that small mind fart that made this small mess we call creation. In the beginning, the universe was created. This has made a lot of people very angry and been widely regarded as a bad move. So let us begin, or more like recall, our romance with Mary Magdalene, and thus get a little closer to leaving the labyrinth and into the sunrise embrace of Pistis Sophia, Faith Wisdom. This is the Coffee, Cigarettes, and Gnosis interview. Today we have uh, Jane Schauberg. How are you doing today, Jane? I'm fine, Miguel. How are you? Ah, oh, just wonderful, wonderful. Like we were talking about just trying to survive this rainy weather. But uh, getting on to the interview, uh, you seem to have a strong affinity to Mary Magdalene. Why do you feel this connection? Well, what I do, Miguel, I'm a New Testament scholar, a feminist scholar, and so one of the things we do, but not the only thing, is to look at some of the f uh, female figures in ancient history and in ancient texts and to see how those figures have influenced images and stereotypes of women in throughout the centuries. So that's the source of my interest in this figure. And you would say she's the most prominent one in ancient Christianity? No, I would say she's the second most prominent. The most prominent is the one that's... Uh, the good girl, uh, the Virgin Mary. And sometimes they're very much confused. So I did work on the good girl uh, in a previous book called The Illegitimacy of Jesus, which has just come out in a 20th, um, and a 20th anniversary edition. Uh, it's called The Subtitle is a Feminist Interpretation of the New Testament Infancy Narratives. So it was kind of a natural progression to go from the study of that figure 
also called Mary or Miriam, to this one. What is your stance on the historicity of Mary Magdalene? I know, for example, you quote Robert Price, and he's kind of vacillated back and forth. Uh, how do you see it? Do you see her as a historical figure? Yeah, I certainly see her as a historical figure. I don't think uh, there's any reason to doubt the historicity. Um, maybe, I mean, I think the reason that some scholars do doubt it is that we don't have any reference to her in material outside of the New Testament Gospels and the Apocryphal Gospels. But I think early on, the, the uh, witness of women, even within the New Testament period, began to be suppressed. So I don't think it's unusual um, that her name would not keep reappearing. And uh, the question I guess most people would have is, why do you think Paul omitted her, or not mentioned her at all, of the witnesses in Galatians? Yeah, that's one of the, uh, it's, it's in 1 Corinthians 15. But that's, then that's the real little nugget, uh, very, very, it's like a little fossil in 1 Corinthians, what Paul learned in his early uh, experience of this movement. You have to look at the, the a variety of logical uh, reasons why the, she and the other women and the empty tomb are not named in that little nugget of information that he gleaned from the early Jerusalem church, apparently. So one would be, uh, and this is popular with many scholars, that the empty tomb and the appearances to the women are a later tradition. Another would be that he was not taught that, uh, either that in the Jerusalem church it had already been suppressed or ignored, and a third possibility is that he himself suppressed it because in Corinth he's in he's in difficulty with the uh, role of women prophets in Corinth who are claiming authority, and he's sort of trying to put the lid on some of that. The thing that's the way we kind of have to look at things as to what are some logical reasons why something would or would not be present here or, not, or absent here. So I go with that third possibility. And there's been a lot of study recently on the role of women, uh, gender roles in marriage, in marriage and in the uh, leadership roles in the communities, in the community in Corinth, to which Paul is speaking. So my argument is that it's very possible that the women who are claiming authority there are tracing their own authority back to the Galilean women in the Jesus movement. And uh, might as well get this out of the way, because of course some people will want to know, what is your stance on Jesus being married to Mary Magdalene? Or do you have a stance? Well, I don't think there's any evidence for a marriage between the two. There are erotic overtones or undertones in John 20. There are uh, echoes of the Song of Songs. There are the beloved, the, the garden, the searching for the loved one, and so forth, and love that's stronger than death. But... We don't have any uh, evidence of marriage, and we also don't have it in the apocryphal texts. Uh, in some of them, Je um, Mary is called Jesus' koinonos, which means companion or partner. It could mean lover. Uh, one of the problems, I think, and one of the reasons why people are very interested in this question um, is, sort of a, is sort of a subtle reason that if Jesus and Mary Magdalene were lovers or married, it makes Jesus more of a real guy and a heterosexual guy. And basically it's another way of, of uh, downgrading her to the role of Mrs. Jesus, as Dominic Crossan said. And you can see that in the Da Vinci Code, where if you read that book carefully, it doesn't really deserve all that careful reading, but if you <laughs> do read it carefully, you'll see that what she is basically there is a vessel that is a womb. Yeah, instead of a instead of a leader, which is what she yeah. was. Mm -hmm. That's what I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was very normal back in the early Christian days to have these, uh, you know, sister wives couple, these kind of uh, celibate men and women walking around preaching. Well, we don't know enough about that at this point in time. There certainly were, in the post-resurrection or the post-crucifixion period. Paul does talk about people being a, men being accompanied by their sisters, whatever that means, and wives. Uh, but there are also people who are choosing to be celibate, and that's causing a problem. So in terms of the internal workings of this movement with Jesus at the center of it, the historical Jesus at the center of it, it isn't clear what their, you know, sleeping arrangements were. Right. <laughs> So that's, you know, inquiring minds want to know, and sometimes we just cannot know. 
what do you think, uh, what does Mary mean and what does her last name mean, Magdalene? The word, the name Mary is a common, a common woman's name of this period. Its source way, way back is, comes from the word bitter. But it's, you know, it's like our names today. We don't uh, remember Mm -hmm. the etymology of it. I forget the percentage of women that are named Mary in this first century period. It's very, very high. And for males, Johanan or John, very, very high also. So it's a common name. And there are many Marys in the New Testament, and that's part of the reason why her legend gets becomes confused with, I mean, her story becomes confused and develops into a legend that combines a lot of other figures. The word uh, Magdalene, I think, comes from the town of Migdal on the western side of the Sea of Galilee. And I just read in uh, the Internet today on the Biblical Archaeology Review site that there's going to be excavation there continuing. It, it was stopped since the 1970s, but it's going to be started up again at that site on the western side of the Sea of Galilee. Wow, that's great. Mm-hmm. And there was for sure a tower, I mean, I'm sorry, a t- tower, yeah, that's what I'm thinking, Magdalene. Well, the, yeah, the word Migdal also means tower. There was apparently a tower there, but it, uh, I know Spong thinks that uh, it's a nickname for her, Mary the Tower rather than Mary of Migdal. Well, I don't think you have to make those those kinds of distinctions. And there was a for sure a town called Magdalene back in the time. Some people say, like Nazareth, it didn't exist, it didn't exist. Right. It was only a later addition. Well, there, were, there was a site there for sure, yes. She seems to be given quite prominence in the canonicals. Do you think it's accidental? They were trying to repress it, and it just kind of filtered through, or was it intentional? In the canonical Gospels, you only have one mention in Luke 8 of uh, women that is named women, named and unnamed women who were traveling with Jesus in the in the work of that group. But in the other Gospels, um, the women appear for the first time at the uh, cross. So they're witnesses to the death and the burial and the empty tomb. So they're very, very essential to the story. But they come in in the three Gospels. They come in at the end of the story. So there's, but, but they're said at that point to have been, at least in Matthew and uh, uh, Mark, they're said to have been with uh, Jesus from Galilee. They're su- you can say suppressed if you want uh, to, to notice that there's no call narrative, there's no stories that involve them. There must have been actual uh, historical events that they were a part of in order for them to be loyal at the end, but we don't have that information. We don't have those traditions. And you said that the one, what is your take on the scene in John? You said it was almost erotic in which Jesus... Uh, in which Mary Magdalene can't touch Jesus. What do you? How do you uh, decipher that scene? Well, the scene in John 20 is the scene where Mary Magdalene, either alone or with somebody else, comes to the tomb, uh, finds it empty, is confused, uh, asks for help, eventually um, encounters uh, the risen Jesus but doesn't recognize him, which is a common theme indicating that he's changed. Um, she recognizes him when he speaks her name, and then she says Rabuni, which means little teacher or beloved teacher. The erotic elements have to do with uh, not finding him, searching for him, so forth, and the sight of the garden, which echoes the Song of Songs. The not touching, I think, I, I, I am more interested in the idea that, which is very, very strange, um, he says, I am ascending. Go and tell my uh, brothers and sisters, I am ascending, which is odd. So it puts him kind of in the interim between death and final whatever, glorification or whatever. So that to me echoes the uh, Two Kings story where Elisha, the disciple of Elijah, is trying to follow him, trying to, in a way, hold him back. But he witnesses his ascent and then... in the Elijah, Elijah story, he receives a double portion of his spirit, his prophetic spirit. So I think that last part is left off in John 20. My reading of that indicates that Mary Magdalene would be a successor of Jesus, and she is the witness of his ascent. 
Well, I certainly like that. <laughs> yeah, it's a, a different reading. Yeah, and being a big fan of Mary Magdalene. And, um, How come like, you're a big fan? Oh, well, of course I'm a Gnostic, so I'm a big mm -hmm. follower of her. Anything and what she symbolizes and what she is, I've always, I'm, I'm you convinced. You know this Gnostic thing out in Palo Alto? Palo it's, Alto. Yeah, it's, um, it's a uh, Gnostic sanctuary uh, run by Rosamond, not run by, but headed by Rosamond Miller. And if you go online and look up, I think, Gnostic Sanctuary, it's in the Palo Alto area. Um, and she runs a, she has a church out there, a Gnostic church. It's very, very interesting. It's worth the trip. Oh, yes, I've heard of it, yes. Yes? Yeah? Uh -huh. used to be over a donut shop. <laughs> yes, yes, that's true. Yeah, but now she's building, or has built, uh, an actual sanctuary. Well, yeah, that's certainly uh, always good to hear. Again, a uh, big yeah. fan of Mary Magdalene and uh, right. everything Magdalene. <laughs> huh. um, but what do you think, like, uh, Margaret Starbird, like, is that's one of her big uh, fights is to say that Mary Magdalene is Mary of Bethany. What do you think, Jane? Well, Margaret Starbird is, I think, a novelist and using her imagination to uh, do the kind of thing that legend-making does which is fill in the gaps and, you know, talk things in here and there. Um, I don't see that identification as reliable, historically speaking. The methodologies that we use for New Testament criticism and historical criticism aren't the same thing as people use when they're trying to create a novel. But didn't some of the church fathers believe that yeah. early on and then it kind of changed towards history? <clears throat> Well, the the legend is a slow, you know, snowball thing. It snowballs through the centuries, uh, basically connecting with uh, not so much Mary of Bethany, but the woman of the city who's a sinner in Luke 7, and under, read by most people as meaning a prostitute, and the woman in John uh, 8 or wherever it is, the woman caught in adultery. So you get this core legend of Mary Magdalene that just grows and grows and grows. And yes, Fathers of the Church contributed to it. Pope Gregory, uh, you know, anointed it, uh, and it just grows and grows and grows. It makes, uh, you know, good literature in a way, a yeah, good story. And some people mourn the fact that historical uh, research is deconstructing that. Yeah, I remember my first taste of Mary Magdalene was being a kid and watching Jesus of Nazareth and seeing Anne Bancroft and yes. forever I thought <laughs> she's a whore. She's a whore. <laughs> well, Aunt, but I think Anne Bancroft's portrayal of Mary Magdalene is really quite good. I mean, she, forget the whore business, but they got an angry woman to play that figure, and I love the part at the end where she bangs out of the room and lets the door slam behind her. And what about, what is your take on the, the beloved disciple? There's all this r rumors going on that the beloved disciple might have been Mary. What do you think? When you ask a question like that, you're asking about different levels of transmission. If you're asking about the level of, of uh, what the, fi the, the final editor of the Gospel of John thought of this figure, the figure is presented as male and uh, is also presented in the same scenes with Mary Magdalene. So the answer there would be no. If in some previous level of transmission there was a beloved disciple, a person called the beloved disciple, that was important in the Johannine community, which was very different from other early Christian communities, whether that could have been a female figure and then transmorgified into a male figure, uh, that's a possibility. But the other thing about the beloved disciple is that it seems also to be almost like a symbolic figure. It's, it's, it's very strange. It's both concrete and symbolic. And it's said to be, uh, in some ways, it's said to be the, uh, the guarantee for the witness that's being provided in the Gospel of John. And you mentioned in your book that probably no biblical figure has had such a vivid and bizarre post-biblical life in the mm -hmm. human imagination, in legend, and in art. Why mm -hmm. do you think this has been the case, Jane? Well, because it's well, sexy, basically. <laughs> it's sex sells. Yeah, sex mm -hmm. sells, of mm -hmm. course. Yeah. I mean, if you go to the art museum, you're not going to find uh, any Magdalene's. You're going to find a lot of Magdalene's weeping and kissing the feet of Jesus and with their hair down and all of that, and you'll find the 
uh, what Susan Haskins, the art historian, calls pious pornography, the half-naked <laughs> bagged ones uh, repenting of their past and all of that. So it's, uh, you know, it's bizarre. And also it uh, the idea was that if she could be saved, anybody could be. So she's like the worst of the worst. She never quite gets over in the legend. She never quite, quite uh, escapes her whorish past. Um, but now we're finding with the, uh, you know, the publication of the Gospel of Judas, uh, fairly recent publication of the Gospel of Judas through National Geographic magazine, and now different translations uh-huh. of that. That well, Judas has always been also a an interesting figure in the movies and in legend, uh, not not at the level of Mary Magdalene, uh-huh. but now I think we're seeing that early Christians have spent a lot of time trying to figure out. Uh, the kind of questions that people still ask is how could how could someone who was in the movement betray him and what does the betrayal mean and was it betrayal and what what could motives be you know Do, doesn't the the image of Mary Magdalene change with the sexual views of each era yeah absolutely in the 19th century and 18th century it's very interesting people like to pose their mistresses and wives as Mary Magdalene in in paintings and photography don't ask me why. No, <laughs> I have no idea why. <laughs> let's not, sexual therapy. Let's not get into huh? that. <laughs> right, right. And in many cases, she's dressed in different uh, centuries in the costume of a prostitute that would be recognizable. And actually, in the movies too. Um, I forget how Hartley has a movie. It's a Jesus movie, but it doesn't have Jesus in the title. And he has uh, Mary Magdalene figure with the, the, you know, the tall vinyl boots. I think she's chewing gum and stuff. So. You know, century by century, we get that. What is your favorite uh, Mary Magdalene in the movies? My favorite is Denny Arcon's Mary Magdalene uh, figure, who he still is kind of operating with this whorish past business, but he has a Mary Magdalene figure who, you know, it's a two-level film. The It's a cast of passion play performers in 20th century Montreal that perform the passion play and then the figure, the actor that represents Jesus dies, is killed accidentally. And uh, the powers that be, advertising and radio and so forth, want to commercialize on that. And the Mary Magdalene figure there just says, excuse me, and then just walks away from the movement and out of the, uh, out of the future of it, really, and then looks out over the city of Montreal with her back to the audience. That's my favorite. And were you surprised that uh, Mel Gibson decided to completely eschew the the whore part of Mary Magdalene? He didn't. Oh, he didn't? No. Oh, I must have missed it through all the gore. Huh? I must have missed it through all the gore. Well, yeah. I she, thought she her was... part is not, yeah, right. The gore does overwhelm the story, <laughs> that's for sure. But no, look again, because the first time you see her, you see those earrings dangling. Yes. And she's crawling along, and it's the John 8 scene where she's about to be stoned for adultery. Oh, I must have missed that. Yeah, go back and look again. I had to watch it two times because uh, I did an article on, there's a book called Mel Gibson's Bible, and I did the (laughs) article on uh, Mary Magdalene in there. And it's very interesting because uh, uh, she mostly, I don't know that she has even any line. She mostly just covers her face, looks away screams, um, and she's kind of overpowered by the mother of Jesus figure, who is a much better True. actress. And what are some of the more outrageous legends about uh, Mary Magdalene that you've heard? I think one you mentioned is the uh, where the wedding at Cana was actually John and Mary Magdalene, and Jesus comes and breaks it up. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's one, and there, breaks it up, and therefore she has to be a whore, uh, you know, because she's so disappointed. But the one I kind of like the most, or two that I like the most in a way, if you could be said to like these things. Um, and one of them, set in southern France, uh, she is, she spends the last 30 years of her life in repentance up in the mountains with no food. And uh, she's fed by ravens. And so that's a pretty good one. <laughs> and then the other one is a sweeter one. It's it's from the, uh, the Carmog region in southern France where She's linked with other Marys, and they uh, they kind of come through the sky to help people that are uh, in need. But the idea there, the legend behind that is that uh, 
Mary Magdalene and some other New Testament and post New Testament figures escape from Jerusalem in a boat and they come to southern France. And that's that's more associated with her preaching powers more than the the whoring. Yeah, and I don't know if you want to talk to, about this. Uh, when I interviewed Margaret Starbird and I interviewed somebody else, they didn't want to talk about it. But uh, what, do you, what about this outrageous one in which uh, uh, Jesus pulls out a woman from his own rib and has sex with her in front of Mary Magdalene? Oh, yeah, right. Uh, well, that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm trying to remember. Uh, I think that's an Epiphanius. Yes, it is, actually. And... Uh, yeah, it's very bizarre. Um, it's, cer- it's certainly it reenacting something from Genesis. Um, a lot of those things that we get in the Church Fathers are just like little snippets, and we don't get the full, you know, meaning of whatever that kind of thing is. Like, doesn't he also eat his own semen? Is yes, that- yes, it's a very... Yeah. I, I've, I've been trying to get my mind around it for so well, long. Well, a lot of um, times the fathers, so-called fathers of the Church would accuse... Um, there are enemies of all kinds of strange activities like eating semen, eating menstrual blood, sacrificing children, you know, free-ranging sex, that kind of thing, infanticide, whatever. And uh, so that's probably uh, connected with some kind of a thing that we don't have the whole of it because the fathers would just take out these snippets. That's what makes the discovery of the apocryphal materials in the 20th century and now so important because now for the first time we can hear these other voices for themselves not just not just being quoted by their enemies the fathers of the church and epiphanius was he was accusing this of being a gnostic tale or just kind of a yeah, white that's, that's my memory of it yeah. yeah and so i guess moving on to the gnostic I wonder why they didn't want to talk about it I don't know. <laughs> they just got uncomfortable. <laughs> it's a pretty, yeah. uh, it's pretty lewd sex scene. Jesus and yeah. this new Eve in front of Mary Magdalene. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't. Yeah, a lot of the stuff, like also Mary Magdalene laughing at the Eucharist. It's very hard to make sense of the, you know, the little snippet that we get. You know, who knows? We may get the fuller thing with those snippets in it. You know, later on. And then we may see that some of those snippets were actually, you know, inaccurate. How would you separate the, uh, what's the difference or what are the characteristics of the Gnostic Mary Magdalene from the uh, canonical Mary Magdalene? Well, one of the things that we have to increasingly be aware of is that uh, scholars of these apocryphal works are telling us not to, not to use the word Gnostic too loosely. Right. Because we're seeing now that these are individual works, <clears throat> and if we, you know, it's like uh, don't harmonize the four canonical gospels. Don't make them into one story, because they each have a voice of their own. Same thing with these these uh, more recently discovered works. If we give them the umbrella Gnostic, then we assume that they have all this mythological uh, stuff that they're there's that is a part of their picture. But if we look at them individually, for example, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene does not have any of that. That's why a lot of scholars will not call it, like Karen King, does not think of the Gospel of Mary Magdalene as Gnostic. It doesn't have this bizarre, uh, very, very elaborate mythological system. It's, it's very, very different, and some of the others are that way, too. So, But in general, what I did in, in uh, my book was to look at the fact that the Mary Magdalene that appears in the non-canonical text or the apocryphal text. There's she basically she's prominent in the post-resurrection period. So a lot of the apocryphal texts they don't really deal with the lifetime of Jesus. They deal with afterwards and they deal with the secret teachings that were given or non-secret teachings that were given to certain people afterwards in the post-resurrection period. So they're, they're in great part, some of them are, are mystical texts. So first point is that she's prominent, but she's prominent in texts that are still male-centered. So there's a, a, you know, a tension there. Uh, she speaks very boldly. In the New Testament canonical texts, I think she only speaks twice. She says in John 20, they have taken the body of my Lord and I don't know where they've laid. Well, she has three things. 
I don't know where they've laid him. And she says, if you've taken the body, tell me and I'll go get him. And then she goes back and, and speaks to the others and says, I've seen the Lord. But in the non-canonical text, she's, she's a real leader. She's jumping up to ask questions. She's a very, very bold speaker. Uh, she's a visionary. And they talk about her mystical understanding. And in fact, in the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, she recounts a vision that she has of Jesus, which has to do with the ascent of the soul. Um, she's praised by Jesus and others for having um, superior understanding. This is the one that understands, you know. And she's uh, she's called in several texts his intimate companion or koinonos. Isn't she called the woman who knew the all in one of the yeah. texts? Yeah, uh-huh. the woman who knew the all, the woman who understood completely. Um, she's also opposed by the male disciples, and often it's Peter, sometimes it's others, sometimes it's all of them. When she's trying to, she leads them, but she's opposed by them, and then she's defended, usually by Jesus, and some once in the Gospel of Mary Magdalene by uh, uh, Levi. None of that is the case in the canonical Gospels. So this was kind of very, very surprising when people started to put together these aspects of the of the apocryphal Mary Magdalene, and each text does not have all of those traits. You know, some of them only have, uh, well, all of the texts that I dealt with, and there are 13 of them, have at least five of those traits that I just mentioned. So, But it's only the Gospel of Mary Magdalene that's got all nine traits. So the, the non-canonical picture is very, very different. The other thing that's different is that she is not uh, merged with other women in, you know, legend. She is not uh, a whore. She doesn't, that never develops in the apocryphal material. She's attacked for uh, being a woman, but not for her, not for her loose sexuality or anything like that. Yeah, you don't uh, delve into, uh, for example, the Pista Sophia, but in that one she's given a lot of prominence, isn't she? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. And uh, what other, uh, what, could you name some of the texts in which Mary appears? Um, the Gospel appears? of Philip. The Gospel of Philip is a very important one. And you can get those now, you know, in uh, the Nag Hammadi Library, which is a, you know, I forget, it's Harper and Rowe, I think, that it's gone into several editions. You can get it... Um, I believe, in a book from Polbridge Press called The Complete Gospels, which now is not complete because uh, the Gospel of Judas came out afterwards. (laughs) Uh So we should never use complete in our titles now. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, you never know what uh, Egypt's going to toss out of the sand. Or somebody's library, you know. (laughs) Oxford Library or the U of M Library. Tufts and libraries all over the world. Uh Russia, Ethiopia. And uh, do you, so you basically believe, and uh, or am I reading too much, and that there was probably a wide Mary cult in the first and second century? I don't know if I would use the word cult. I think there was, there was uh, women's leadership in the first and second centuries, and that some women in those centuries probably did look to this figure of Mary Magdalene as a precedent. But cult... Uh, the cult comes later when you get cult of the bones and cult of the skull. And I don't know what cult means anyway. I mean, yeah, the reverencing of her, I don't think is, uh, I don't think you even see, what you see in the Gospel of Philip and some of the other apocryphal things, like things like this woman understood the all or this woman understood perfectly. But she's not a cult figure in a way because she's embedded with the others, but they turn to her for or sometimes they don't, uh, for explanations, and and she's given praise. But cult? I don't know about cult. And another one, another gospel we miss, which most people miss because it's not either Gnostic or didn't appear in the Nag Hammadi Library, isn't that the Acts of Philip? Is that the one she has a big prominence in? Yeah, she has prominence in the Acts of Philip, and uh, Beauval from uh, Harvard is, has worked on that text. That's later, and she... Uh, yeah, she's very prominent. She she's uh, kind of like she's got kind of a, a role in terms of assessing who goes where. I believe, if I'm not wrong on that, like a sort of not more than a secretary, like a like directing you know missionary movements and stuff. Isn't that where she cross dresses as well? Yes, 
But cross-dressing is uh, not only in that text, it's in other texts like the Acts of Paul and Thecla, cutting your hair and cross-dressing. I mean, for one thing, it would make travel possible for a woman who's unaccompanied. What other just uh, what other instances of egalitarianism, egalitarianism do we see in the first century outside of Mary? Anything? Well, the fact that there were women in the so-called Jesus movement, or as Mary Rose D'Angelo prefers to call it, it's the Kingdom of God movement. This focuses on the Kingdom of God, not so much on Jesus. That comes later. Um, the fact that there are women and men traveling together, um, the fact that the women are the witnesses of the execution, that they stay loyal and so forth, and some of the teachings there. We have no negative uh, teaching from Jesus about women, negative toward women. Uh, but on the other hand, we also have no explicit statement of Jesus against sexism or against non-egalitarianism. So it's not egalitarian in, in the 21st century uh, meaning of the term, but I think what you've got is something that springs out of a more egalitarian form of Judaism than we are used to imagining. Um, now we have scholars looking at things like were there women in the Pharisee movement? Um, Professor Tal Alon from, I think, Berlin now argues yes. Were there women Essenes down at Qumran? Uh, some people say yes. So the women's, the, it's like it's like doing women's history in every period. Uh, the women are not, you have to dig for it. You have to look carefully. You have to be trained to, to look at the, uh, you know, to look at the traces. It's, and it's also like doing African-American history or any uh, any history of, uh, of a suppressed group. But doesn't uh, Josephus write that Thera Pute had women yes. in their ranks, right? Yes, and they're very interesting. Uh, Joan Taylor has a really good article on those, and and it's they're, it's important because they use the imagery of the priesthood um, and the temple and so forth, and so they felt quite free to do that. Yeah, and who knows how many other groups like that, you know, existed. And what do you think Paul's views are? I've heard it said that some of the some of the well beyond the uh obviously the pseudo pauls beyond that some of his uh comments about women not being able to teach and all that is actually interpolations because it contradicts him talking about how women should prophesy and so forth what's uh -huh. your view on paul yeah well the text you're talking about is is uh, 1 Corinthians 14 right a little section in there and either that I mean then you get these kind of logical problems um, either it's an interpolation, because and the view for that, the, the view that what supports that is it's very much like the view of the Deuteropaulines in the after the turn of the century. You know, I, you know, I permit no woman to speak and so forth. Uh, or it's just about married women because they're supposed to ask their man at home if they don't understand rather than asking questions in the assembly. So that if the second view is correct, it would leave the unmarried women and free to speak in the assembly. So that's a question mark there. Paul in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 7, it's a very amazing chapter um, about a balanced marriage that the husband owes his uh, body and his life to his wife and vice versa. It's not a, it's, you know, it's not a, he's uh, with one end on the ground. Um, but then he's got, I think it's 1 Corinthians 11, when he's got this, really very funny chapter about women are prophesying in Corinth without the veils on their head. The veils apparently right. represent subordination. So he, he gives about 15 reasons, and you can see him sweating through <laughs> all these illogical <laughs> reasons, and finally he just pounds his head, hand on the thing and says, it's, it's what we do. You know, We do it because we do it. Put the Mac on. So, yeah, he's it's he's a very fascinating person whose his life was really devoted to the idea that Jews and Gentiles would come together in a community, and so he focused on that rather than on gender issues or the slavery issue. But all three of them are part, I think, of the uh, well, they're part of the early baptismal formula in Galatians three. It took centuries. I mean, nobody succeeded in the early centuries in, in creating a kind of community that, that baptismal formula envisions. 
Well, I think that's about it, Jane. Uh, okay. What do you have? Uh, what do you have? Are you writing anything for the future? More on Mary Magdalene um, or women's issues? Uh, I might. Well, I I might be doing something on the Eucharist, but I'm not sure yet. But right now, what I'm writing is a a memoir about life in uh, 17th Street in Detroit. I'm writing with my goddaughter and my godson. Um, it's a, it's a story about a grieving family, multiracial family multi-generational family in the urban ghetto here. Oh dear. So that's what I'm doing right now. <laughs> oh, okay. Sounds like a great book. I uh, hope it will be. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, best of luck with that. And, okay, but uh, Miguel. Uh, I'm sorry, yes? Can, can you stop smoking? Can I stop smoking? Yeah. No, I don't think so. <laughs> oh, please. My mother died of emphysema. Oh, I'm sorry. And when I went on your thing and I saw you smoking there, I thought, oh, no. Please, try. I love smoking, Jane. <laughs> I know you do, but don't you love life? Uh, To an extent, I guess. <laughs> oh, well, come on. <laughs> please. <laughs> I'm definitely not at the stage right now. No? But, uh, yeah. What would, what would get you there? I don't know, really. Maybe some well, health issue. <laughs> I'll tell you what helped me. Oh, you, you're what, a former smoker? Yeah, what helped me was water. Water? Yeah, water. It's mm -hmm. cheap. Every time I wanted to, well, first you have to sort of change your, you know, locations and stuff. But every time I would sit down at the computer or whatever, or the telephone, or after oh, a meal. Oh, yes. Oh, God, you know, yes. Uh -huh. That would be the times. Uh, instead, drink a lot of water, and pretty soon it sort of gets out of your system. But I'm a cancer survivor, so uh, oh, I had to. Congratulations! Do it. Well, uh -huh. thanks, but it's come back now. So. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so yeah, sorry. Well, I'll definitely okay. take your words at heart. <laughs> That's <Please>. for sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Please, I'd like to be able to turn your 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 website on, and I'll see you with. With a glass of water. <laughs> yeah, I'll call it coffee water. I know, coffee yeah. water and gnosis. There's tons of water. I think what it does is just purify the system, you know? Uh -huh. It gets the caffeine out of the system. Uh -huh. You don't believe me. Uh, of course I believe you. You do? Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh. Well, I thought you said, yeah, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've known a lot of people who've quit smoking, and they, they have everybody has a different... Uh, Strategy, right. you know, right. bird right. seeds, apples, all that. But, yeah. You know, I can say at this point in time, I love it. I can't. Well, fear you know. is a good one, and I hope you don't have to have that to drive you away from it. Only time will tell. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, anyway, uh, thanks a lot for being on the show. And, sure. Uh, I enjoyed and, it. Okay, and uh, we will have you on soon. Okay. Bye. Thanks, Miguel. And there you have it, my beloved truth seekers, the interview with Jane Schauber, author of Mary Magdalene Understood, The Resurrection of Mary Magdalene, as well as Professor of Religious Studies and Women's Studies at the University of Detroit Mercy. Not only did she gift us with a wonderful exposition on Mary Magdalene, she gave a certain God above God a pause to thinking about his vice. Of course, the mortal incarnation of Abraxas will continue paying homage to the devil by smoking. This week it's been eight years since I abandoned heavy drug use and alcohol, so allow me to indulge in nicotine and sugar. Sometimes quality of life is more important than quantity, but for some reason in the West we've become obsessed with making people live longer instead of obsessed with making people live better. And we hope the best for Jane and her valiant battle with cancer. If you believe in prayer, please pray for her. If you believe in affirmations, throw a hurt her way. If you believe in keeping people in your thoughts or hearts, save a place for her. Any positive expression would be great, my beloved true seekers. Get better, Jane. Your road to fighting for the feminine cause is not over yet. Continue and I'd like to play the nine atmospheres of Mary Magdalene from Coffee, Cigarettes, and Gnosis number four in which our guest was Margaret Starbird. It is based on Jane's insights in the resurrection of Mary Magdalene. I seriously doubt you'll ever find a better dissection of the Gnostic Mary, the leader, the equal to the Christ, the woman who understood the all. And take it easy, please. It was my fourth show. 
I sounded like a morning DJ and my expertise at mixing was even worse than now, but I am confident you'll come away with a new admiration for the Spike Nart pop scene. So join me now as we travel the nine atmospheres of Mary Magdalene. In her book, uh, Scharberg outlines nine hallmarks that define Mary Magdalene from the Gnostic point of view. And it's impossible not to. When the Nag Hammadi Library was discovered in 1945 in Upper Egypt, Mary M. was definitely and undoubtedly presented as an important figure in the formation of the once and real Christianity. He's not the Messiah! He's a very naughty boy! Even outside the NHL, uh, which, which is what I call the Nag Hammadi for short, Mary M. appears as the holy diva in certain blasphemous texts such as the Gospel of Mary, the Pista Sophia, the Acts of Philip, the Gospel of Peter, and the Manichaean Psalm text. What we need to do today as truth seekers and Gnostics in order to recover our heroine, rescue the princes of our spiritual desires from her tower, and or bring forth the empiring fem feminine that will perhaps alleviate 2,000 years of male global rape is get a good framework for the spikenard Popsy. I'll swallow your soul! So here are the nine, as I call them, atmospheres of the Gnostic Mary Magdalene. Number one, Mary is prominent. Unlike the ca canonical Gospels, Mary M. is shown as a protagonist in the divine drama and mystery of the dying and rising God man. She is no magna peccatrix, or great sinner as the church called her for centuries. She is no whore or sugar mama for the twelve disciples who can't hold down jobs. There are no misconceptions about who she is. Let's just say that the camera spends a lot of time on her. In the NHL's Dialogue with the Savior, Mary is considered a sister and equal to those spreading the light of Gnosis. In the Gospel of Philip, she is the one who, quote, always walks with the Lord, unquote. Now if you look at the Old Testament, you'll notice that, that only Enoch and Noah walked with the Lord. That's quite a VIP pass, if you ask me. Enoch and Noah are favorites of the Old Testament God. But Mary M. is obviously the favorite of the new and true God. Yes, the Gospel of Philip also says that the Christ used to kiss her on the mouth often. But I already addressed this on the second show, if you want to take a look at it. In any event, a kiss is just a kiss. But to the Gnostics' eyes, it means that a kiss is the transference of esoteric, salvific information or Gnosis, and it thus grants Mary M. the power to conceive spiritual offspring. Give me some sugar, baby. Like Sophia, who fell out of the treasury of light into the primordial waters of chaos, Mary M. is no longer a lost soul, but now has returned to her partner in a union of inordinate catharsis. Another example is, the, is in the Pista Sophia, where Mary Magdalene is the most prominent member of the group asking questions to the Risen Logos. This is your life, and it's ending one minute at a time. Number two. Mary is portrayed in a world with androcentric language and patriarchal texture. Eh, what are you going to do? I'll tell you what you're going to do. Look for a deeper meaning and don't get too caught up in 21st century sensibility. Knock off the politically correctness, for it is a tool of Jehovah remade by his angelic mafia's PR machine. I am the architect. Change the words if you don't like them until your passion is calibrated to your mind. When these texts were written, the male aspect was considered primary, so a uh, father would 
come before mother, or male before female, and so on. But they're only words. Sticks and stones may break your bones, but words will only break your heart. Quite a little mouth on him, isn't there? A good example is the word whore, which in ancient times and esoteric circles had the connotation of being a lost soul. Not like not a uh, Julia Roberts in Pretty Woman or a Jane Fonda in Clute. In reality, we all are whores while we linger in this world. Even Sophia is called a whore or the barren one in the NHL. In the same NHL, the exiges of the soul, um, we, we have a great story of how souls fall into the material world and are defiled by the angelic mafia. I was cured, all right. Uh, other scholars have posed that a, uh, a whore is actually a synonym for a priestess. So it's all about being a little discriminate, discerning, and accessing data in a way that works for you. What matters is that you do what the Gnostics do and find a way to balance and reconcile these words and concepts. Stay disattached from them uh, from your base emotions until they are before you and you can rise to the next meaning. Has been and a little knowledge won't hurt either, truth seekers. After all, context is king, like the word whore itself. Uh, we find in the Gospel of Thomas a saying that fundies love to use to prove that Gnostics are as chauvinistic as they are. The saying is Logian number 114. Uh, many people believe it was added long after the Gospel of Thomas was written, but uh, that's debatable. Anyway, it goes like this. Simon Peter said to them, Make Mary leave us, for females don't deserve life. Jesus said, Look, I will guide her to make her male, so that she too may become a living spirit resembling you males. For every female who makes herself male will enter the kingdom of heaven. And don't forget, to a Gnostic being alive simply means being awakened. And at first glance, it looks like my boys were no better than Tertullian. Irenaeus, Augustine, and the old gang of Christian founders who thought of women as a source of all sin. And it hasn't helped that uh, even after uh, I set up uh, Demi Moore with Tertullian, he still doesn't get it. Well, he can't get it up. All right, Demi Moore, I'll take care of you later. God has a heart on as usual, these old boys uh, miss the mark, and so do our, so do our modern fundies. The word for man used is anthropos in Greek, which actually means a complete, fulfilled human being. I'm sure some of you have heard of Plato's uh, The Hermaphrodite, the account that says that once there was only one sex, the gods felt jealous, much like Jehovah did when Adam and Eve ate from the fruit of knowledge. And then the gods cleaved the hermaphrodite into two, man and woman. And thus every person seeks throughout the, the ages his or her counterpart to once again become higher than the petty gods. You just wait, Jehovah, Zeus, Allah, or whatever you thunder gods call yourself these days. That God does not like you. And when all else fails, move to the flow. Do what you gotta do like Mary Magdalene does in the Acts of Philip. You can't handle the truth! She picks her battles well. Instead of worrying that she is a woman and calling the Palestine ACLU, she dresses like a man and takes on her quest with the Christ at her side, proving herself braver, wiser, and more aware than the Apostle Philip, who was supposed to be the champion of the story. Now that's using your energy wisely, Mary. She was a Tootsie in reverse in ancient times. Or maybe a Mulan of the Middle East or something like that. You're not your job. You're not how much money you have in the bank. 
Not the car you drive. You're not the contents of your wallet. You're not your fucking khakis. You're the all singing, all dancing crap of the world. Number three in the atmospheres of Mary. And that is, Mary is bold in her speech. As Schaberg writes, the Gnostic Mary has been giving a voice that is powerful, insistent, and courageous. She comfortably enters into dialogue with Jesus, questioning him and giving him theological explanations of her own. In other words, not only does Mary Magdalene get it, but she serves as the one who finishes the thoughts of the Redeemer. The two give a complete picture of how to become liberated from ignorance, from the Matrix. They are partners because they are Plato's hermaphrodite who has become united as the Anthropos, the fulfilled and complete being, the heavenly Adam, the Autogenes, the thought and wisdom of the true God. The perfect world is a dream. But In the NHL's Dialogue with the Savior, Mary is described as the woman who understood completely. She is no theological blonde, truth seekers. And uh, believe me, that sort of responsibility is not an easy thing to carry. Understanding too well. In the Didasclia Apostolum, I think I'm saying it right, John argues that women should not be disciples because they are weak. And uh, he also saw Mary laughing during the Last Supper. How dare she laugh at a party? But Mary's reply is that, quote, I did not really laugh, only I remember the words of our Lord, and I exulted. For ye know that he told us before, when he was teaching, the weak shall be saved through the strong. And Mary is the strong one in Gnostic holy writs. Like the Gnostic Jesus, Mary M. has a sense of humor at the cosmic joke that was played on us and the true good news that she spreads. All learning is remembering and we can awaken to a better truth. And maybe you've also noticed this uh, odd synchronicity of seeing Mary and the Apostle John together again. Interestingly enough, in the Pisa Sophia, the Christ proclaims that Mary Magdalene and John the Virgin will be superior to all my disciples. In the Gospel of Mary, Peter becomes jealous of Mary Magdalene in the same way Peter was jealous of the beloved disciple in the Gospel of John. Hmm, looks like uh, we got more proof that John and Mary might be one and the same in some sense or another. Just because there are things I don't remember doesn't make my actions meaningless. The world doesn't just disappear when you close your eyes, does it? Number four. Hmm. After I take this uh, sip of my frappuccino. Number four. Mary M. is seen as a leader. This doesn't mean she is always jihading into battle with men at her heels. No. It means authority is given to her and is handled by her. For example, in the Gnostic Sophia of Jesus Christ, the Savior tells all the disciples, including Mary, that, quote, I have given you authority over all things as sons of light, unquote. In the first apocalypse of James, Mary is uh, one of four women that serves as, quote, as a model for how James is supposed to go about with his own mission. Unquote. Number five, Mary is a visionary. That should come to as no surprise by now, truth seekers. Not only is she the one who first sees the rising God man, the new son of hope, the real invincible son, but like in the Pista Sophia, she translates his message with new wrinkles and deeper acumen. I love this line from the Gospel of Mary where she comforts the other disciples after the risen Jesus has returned to the Pleroma, or treasury of light as a prophet Manny called it. Worship that never! But they were grieved. They wept greatly, saying, 
How shall we go to the Gentiles and preach the gospel of the kingdom of the Son of Man? If they did not spare him, how will they spare us? Then Mary stood up, greeted them all, and said to her brethren, Do not weep and do not grieve, nor be irresolute, for his grace will be entirely with you and will protect you. But rather, let us praise his greatness, for he has prepared us and made us into men. When Mary said this, she turned their hearts to the good, and they began to discuss the words of the Savior. Peter said to Mary, Sister, we know that the Savior loved you more than the rest of the women. Tell us the words of the Savior which you remember, which you know, but we do not, nor have we heard them. Mary answered and said, What is hidden from you I will proclaim to you. People that talk in metaphors are to shampoo my crotch. Number six. Mary is praised for her superior understanding. As I mentioned before, she is the woman who understands completely. In several Gnostic accounts, she is praised by Jesus over and over again for her insights. The Gospel of Philip says that the Savior, quote, loved her more than the other disciples, unquote. Why? Because she was hot. Hmm, no, I don't think so. Uh, these people uh, were all meeting for spiritual ravishment, not some uh, single Jewish club. Number seven in our atmospheres of Mary. <coughs> Excuse me. Idiot. Mary is identified as an intimate companion of Jesus. In the Gnostic literature, she is the only person who is ever mentioned as a companion of the Lord. That's pretty telling, if you ask me. The Gnostic Valentinians in the 2nd century thought that Jesus and Mary were the earthly reflection of the heavenly couple of the Holy Spirit and the Christ. Like the Hermetists like to say, as above, so below. Reality, the playground of the Demiurge, is just a reflection of the eternal forever. Mary Magdalene is the new and improved Eve. Well, actually, the correct original Eve for granted knowledge to Adam and helping him escape Jehovah's fool's paradise. Keep your friends close, but your enemies closer. Number eight. Mary is opposed by and in open conflict with one or more of the disciples. I love the smell of napalm in the morning. Um, this is very important because these conflicts symbolized were the precursor and set the stage between the two sides of early Christianity, Orthodoxy and Gnosticism. Uh, in the corner of Gnosticism we have Mary Magdalene, the knower, the one who understands, the one who is sensual and wise, sensitive and emotional. On the Orthodox sides we usually have Simon Peter, who is well-meaning but rather dim, marginally loyal, wanting always an easy answer but not always getting it, or not being satisfied with it. Um, yes, Peter is the rock and has rocks in his head and Christianity was built on his ass. Peter is a symbol of what the winner of the conflict became and what we true seekers and free thinkers have been fighting against for 2,000 years. <sighs> I'm not sounding biased, am I? <laughs> uh, we see the conflict again and again in the Gospel of Mary, Philip, Thomas, the Pistis Sophia, and so forth. Sometimes it's right in front of Jesus, if you can believe that. In other, it's in private arguments. In the Gospel of Mary, Peter frustrates the spikenard Popsy so much that she begins to weep at his insensitivity. The Apostle Levi, probably representing moderate Christianity, has to inter intervene and tell the rockhead to cool it, for she was chosen for an important mission. It's Mary versus the rock, 
and hopefully the real winner will come back to our society. On the surface, it seems that Peter Rockhead detests the Spike Nard Popsy because she is a dame. But I believe, as do many others, that it's truly because she is a Gnostic or a knower. Mary Magdalene is just more spiritually advanced, more mature. Believe me, true seekers, there is a worse hatred than that than that kind of hatred focused on someone of a different gender, or focus on someone who has a different skin color, or a focus even on someone of a different religion. And that is the hatred, a hatred pregnant with envy and pride that the world will have for you when they know that you have, a de you have the deeper secrets of life. History is still smoking with all those mystics and scientists tied at the stake. History is still cringing at all those reputations and lives ruined. History is still weeping at all the heroes of enlightenment swallowed by the iron voice of the mob. Number 9. Mary is defended. Like I said before, Le Levy defends her in the Gospel of Mary, and Jesus has to defend his best friend and at the same time praise her in the other Gnostic Gospels. Uh.